Now the challenges to be addressed in future, uh, social and economic systems are rapidly changing. They're not in equilibrium, they're rather in a transformation process. And I think uh, there's an increasing number of socioeconomic problems to be addressed because of this disequilibrium situation. The president of New York's Columbia University, Lee Bollinger, formulated the issue as follows. The forces affecting societies around the world are powerful and novel. The spread of global market systems are reshaping our world, raising profound questions. These questions call for the kinds of analyses and understandings that academic institutions are uniquely capable of providing. Too many policy failures are fundamentally failures of knowledge. So we must close the knowledge gap between the existing problems and the solutions, and we would like to be in a position to come up with solutions before a problem like this financial and economic crisis occurs. And of course, scientists should also be able to support politicians and business people and other decision makers in addressing practical problems. Now, most of you are, of course, familiar with complex systems, um, so I don't tell you anything new about that. But there are also some people who just recently are got in contact with the field, and also we have a couple of journalists over here, uh, which I'd like to welcome. Thank you for your interest, and uh, for the speakers, I would like to ask uh, to spend some time with them if there is interest in interviews. So I give a short introduction into what complex systems are over here. So we know turbulent fluids, which is one example, but there are examples in all sciences. Traffic flows is another example, large supply chains, social, political, economic, and ecological systems, financial markets, group dynamics, and crowd behavior. And it's a daunting class of problems. It's characterized by a large number of interacting system elements, which could be individuals, companies, countries, or cars, or many other things. And between those elements, there are nonlinear or network interactions, which causes a very rich system behavior, as I will show you in a couple of minutes. And these systems behave usually dynamic rather than static, probabilistic rather than deterministic, and we often find surprising or even paradoxical system behavior, such as, for example, a slower is faster effect. The systems are often hardly predictable, seemingly uncontrollable, and they challenge our common way of thinking. Moreover, they're almost everywhere around us, if we look carefully enough, and it's really a nightmare for decision makers these days. Um, some people mix up what is a complicated and a complex system. So a car, for example, is a complicated system, which is made up of many pieces as well, but there are no dynamical interactions between most of the parts. Well, in the case of traffic flow, cars are interacting, and as a consequence, it can happen that all the drivers would like to go fast, but end up staying in a traffic jam. So this is one of the paradoxical outcomes of nonlinear interactions in complex systems. And in fact, we can have a large, surprisingly large variety of different outcomes as these examples of congestion patterns show. Now you can find also some videos illustrating how these patterns come about on the web. Uh, yeah, what are the implications of nonlinear interactions? So this is the linear, the proportional relationship that um, is assumed in many classical models, also in, in economics, and uh, they are well treatable, mathematical, and everything is well predictable. Uh, but if we have nonlinear interactions, then the resulting system behavior could actually be like this, that we have different regimes or behaviors of the system, and there could be a sudden transition between one regime and another regime, a so-called regime shift, 
which occurs at the so-called critical or tipping point. And uh, that's why the systems behave unresponsive with respect to external influences over a long time, and then suddenly and often very unexpectedly, they could dramatically change their behavior. And uh, this is what makes it so difficult to deal with complex systems. So examples would be sudden public opinion changes. You may be, have been very surprised about how quickly your public opinion changes from pro-war to anti-war or uh, from accepting smoking in the public to banning smoking in the public or how quickly the Swiss banking secret fell after hundreds of years uh, of tradition of this or how the car sales dropped very suddenly. So it's even surprising for experts. Uh, and the background is exactly this phenomenon over here. Then we have usually network interactions, which implies feedback loops, as is indicated over here. Um, that means uh, devil circles or cascade spreading events and unwanted side effects. So it's hard to anticipate what would happen if you try to introduce a certain policy for the good, and then something often happens that was not anticipated and not desired. Um, now, the large number of non-linearly interacting elements um, usually leads to a complex dynamics. Here is just a couple of the dynamical patterns that we find. There are even more complex ones. And uh, we know the problem from the weather forecast um, and also from the phenomenon of chaotic dynamics sometimes also called a butterfly effect. So if we start off with more or less identical, with very minute differences, um, identical, almost identical initial conditions, then eventually the situation becomes unpredictable if there's a chaotic dynamics. And uh, this, of course, is a limit to predictability and then on the other hand, there are limits of control. Uh, as I indicated, big changes may have small, no, adverse, or unexpected effects. Um, and small changes uh, may have big effects. Then there is the principle of Le Chatelier. The system tends to counteract external control attempts. We also have a certain irreducible degree of randomness in these systems in many cases, not only in quantum mechanics. And um, then we may also have delays which cause instabilities and so on. So in any case, uh, regime shifts are quite common and they're often called catastrophes um, because in reality they often cause catastrophes. And so there is a mathematical theory behind that. In physics, it's called phase transitions. And uh, let us focus on the issue of crisis, which is usually a systemic malfunction, uh, which uh, comes about in many cases by cascade spreading. And these uh, cascades, or sometimes called domino effects or avalanche effects, are often triggered by overcritical perturbations or by the coincidence of smaller failures. And we know many examples for that, epidemic spreading, disaster spreading, congestion spreading, or the black of, uh, out of electrical power systems. This shows the causality network, the causal interactions between different factors when there is a heavy thunderstorm which destroys uh, large parts of the system like um, Hurricane Katrina, or this is an example of blackout caused by a ship crossing a certain power line that had to be switched off, and you see very unexpectedly it had consequences all over Europe. And this is a good illustration of how surprising complex systems can behave. And many um, complex systems show power loss or self-organized criticality. That means the system itself try, is, is driven towards uh, the critical threshold or to the tipping point. 
And uh, at these critical thresholds, we often find power laws. Now, what, what is the particular thing about power laws? Um, we're used to normal distributions. Uh, many quantities in life are determined by normal distributions. For example, the high distribution. And uh, then on the other hand, many systems, complex systems show power loss. And you see the consequences over here. Extreme events are much more likely to occur than expected. Say 100% more frequent and that's why we have so many disasters, much more often than people would think. And the same problem occurs in the insurance business. It's important for financial derivatives. And so in many cases, uh, the wrong mathematical theories are applied until today. Things are changing, of course, um, but this is something we have to keep in mind. One could say, okay, so can't we optimize the system somehow? And of course, there's operations reserve. There are very powerful methods to optimize systems. Um, but the problem is uh, classical optimization can only optimize for one goal, even if it's a superposition of different goals. But in the end, there's an optimization for one goal. While one often wants to meet several objectives. Um, the optimization routine may get stuck in a local optimum, which is illustrated over here when we compare linear with nonlinear functions. In many cases, the nonlinearities are much more dramatical than in this case. And their evolutionary dead ends. The best solution for a system may be the combination of two bad solutions. That means gradual optimization may not work. Um, Moreover, optimization tends to drive a system closer to instabilities. We know that from traffic systems where we like to use the full capacity of the road. And once we do it, traffic becomes unstable and we have a capacity drop. That means exactly in the time when we need more capacity. That means during the rush hour, the capacity is even reduced. And this is found for many systems, including logistic systems and many network systems with the dynamics in them. That's how the slower is faster effect comes about. Um, then, moreover, we have the problem of numerical complexity. So many of the systems cannot be optimized exactly online. And that's why in those cases, the optimization is based on average data or on past data. So there are delays which can cause instabilities and the optimization is not really done for the situation which is there. Um, instead, uh, the, the optimization is done for uh, data uh, that don't re represent the reality and as a consequence, we don't have uh, an optimal solution in these uh, situations. And one example is today's traffic light control. Um, there are better ways to do it very recently based on decentralized approaches and self-organization. I also want to uh, mention the problem of parameter calibration, for example, during portfolio optimization. In many cases, we don't have enough data to do it accurately enough. And Emre Condor, who is among us, uh, stated the complexity of financial systems exceeds what is knowable even given all the data we have. We also have to make sense of them. So one of the questions is, what are the relevant indicators or control variables? So is it the last battle? Um, well, in a strongly varying world, strict stability and control is, in fact, not possible or it's excessively expensive. We see that uh, in the public, public spending deficits. I think it's the wrong approach. We need to have a more modern approach, utilizing 
self-organization in, in order to be more efficient and also to be more flexible. So that is kind of the classical approach, the Boeing 747 constructed for stable flight. And look at this plane, here the wings are forwardly directed. That makes flight unstable and it needs to be stabilized all the time. But if you turn off the stabilization control, then it's very agile. So it's very flexible. And so um, these features can actually be used if uh, there are intelligent people like you, scientists who who know how to make use of the particular features of complex systems. We shouldn't fight them, we should use them for ourselves. There are many techniques and methods that are used in the area of complex systems and uh, among them analytical methods, for example, from statistical physics and computational ones such as agent-based modeling. And uh, in fact, uh, there are ways of improving the situation of avoiding or stopping cascade failures and so on. We can change the network structure, we can introduce redundancy, we can limit interconnectedness, we can introduce variety into the system and these kinds of things in this way systems can be made much more resilient than they are today. And uh, here's some examples how uh, to make use of the behavior of complex systems. So one example that shows quite clearly what happens is that if, if you have individuals interact, then there is some self-organization. In that case, for example, there's the formation of lanes, and it seems that there is an invisible hand that's controlling uh, the activity in the system, but it's not. And knowing about these dynamics, we can come up with improved solutions, for example, for pedestrian facilities. And sometimes they're quite counterintuitive. So obstacles put in the right place can actually accelerate the dynamics in these kind of things. And I already mentioned uh, self-control of traffic lights, which is an innovative way of better controlling uh, traffic flows. Then uh, we can use emergence for innovation uh, we can use collective intelligence, wisdom of crowds, prediction markets, and, and many other things. Actually, here's some success stories in fields of application. I just want to mention whether Brigoshin, for example, Thomas Schelling, Paul Grugman, and there are other names to be mentioned. Um, I would like to mention the organization of the internet, research in epidemiology, which will be part of our conference as well, the prevention of crowd stampedes, improvement of traffic flows, um, enhancing reliability of energy supply, and, and these kinds of things. Um, so there are big potentials, and uh, we want to learn more for that. So what needs to be done? We need to have more and better data, better access. We need more multidisciplinary research. Uh, we need such research centers and um, we need to make progress in terms of how to design the interactions between the elements uh, that is called mechanism design. I personally also think we need a new study direction so multidisciplinary research will not anymore fall between the cracks of the disciplines and the OECD, the EU, and the NSF have recognized that and they try to come up uh, with solutions for that problem.